my first Uzi I attend, and essentially I've seen the excellent speakers uh, over the last two days, and sort of the speakers alone and the quality of the speakers is a, is a big challenge to, to stand up against. But sort of we had the other keynote just earlier this afternoon, which really frames sort of or drafted uh, quite a dramatic future about how our understanding about the brain might actually uh, impact our lives and essentially all the neuro axis in terms of uh, how politics, how our economies, how our very understanding ourselves might change. So essentially it has been a very dramatic future as I uh, painted, as I said, and so what, I'm, uh, what I can only do to sort of maybe sort of give this whole uh, event a somewhat more positive um, end is to put some signs um, and share some science with you, which I think is important to understand when we really um, talk about uh, all the different things that happens. So that's exactly what I aim doing, talk to you about large-scale collaborative brain science. Um, and so the interesting thing is uh, scientists are a little bit out of their comfort zone if we have to speak about science that sort of really looks into the future. It's so much more easy to talk about science when you actually wrote your paper it's peer-reviewed, and essentially you've got the pat on the back that yes, your, your, your research work has appeared in, in nature or in science, and essentially that gives you the, all the credentials to of course talk about uh, what, what your idea is. Now it becomes a little more difficult if sort of um, you don't have that yet, because essentially of course um, people say, okay, what is it you're already doing? And um, so if it's so much easier to also just be quiet about things if you don't succeed, if you sort of uh, don't talk before. But so the question really is, is it, sometimes not appropriate to talk about science before actually you all know all the pieces. And of course, there's, there's precedence uh, in this, essentially. There have been famous people talking about sort of the vision for where science should go. And sort of here I quote um, JFK who says, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. That was quite a vision and sort of quite blatantly obvious for the world if sort of you succeed or fail. It's a very easy um, criterion and sort of we know all how, how this worked out. This, it worked out fairly well, but essentially it was a, a quite a um, strong effort and collaborative effort of scientists and engineers to really make that work. Um, and so there were a lot of steps on the way which they didn't know the answer to. Now this in a way must have um, triggered presumably the cartoonist of the New Yorker um, last year, when essentially we see here uh, two presumably scientists uh, claiming um, part of the brain, in a way sort of indicating a race between the United States and Europe, and sort of really uh, illustrating the moon, and sort of, uh, I never would have thought I would use two US presidents in a speech, but the context of this, um, this cartoon is really that essentially a year ago, or a little bit more than a year ago, the EU Commission announced that two FET flagship projects, and I'll talk about that a little bit more, Graphene and the Human Brain Project were essentially awarded um, to, to go into act, action and sort of do research for 10 years to come. And so it just happens that sort of two weeks later, the US President Obama in his uh, State of the Union address said, today our scientists are mapping the human brain to unlock the answers to Alzheimer's. Now is the time to reach a level of research and development not seen since the height of the space race. We need to make those investments. Now at that time, sort of it really looked like that was a response to what the European Commission did, but sort of, um, and sort of details came out a little later, but don't be mistaken, all of these initiatives have years of preparation, and so in that sense, sort of the dra drama that we see in the, in the press uh, sort of is maybe a little bit constructed. But sort of, nonetheless, essentially it is clear that sort of the 21st century, as we heard before, is, uh, is the year of the brain, and it's sort of one of the last frontiers uh, uh, of science to really uh, understand what, what, what this is all about. So, um, what is important to understand, you don't need to be a bird to fly. The reason why I'm saying that is that sort of, like in this analogy of, of landing a man on the moon and bringing him back uh, in one piece, that's a very easy uh, measurable. Now, what is it similarly easy to, to measure what it means to understand the brain? It presumably makes, means very different things to different people. So on the one hand, you might be more philosophical and so say, oh really, I want to understand myself, I want to understand consciousness, I want to understand whether you are conscious. Um, others say I want to um, possibly understand brain diseases. Others say essentially I want to understand intelligence. And so why this is important is that you don't need to be a bird to fly. You can be an airplane. 
right? And you fly as well, but it has very little to do with the biology. You, you might have been inspired, but we heard also earlier that sort of the, um, the efforts of sort of making machines fly and look like birds wasn't the biggest success. But so jet engines work very well. And in that very sense, sort of if, if it is about the cognitive computing, intelligence, and sort of making machines do tasks which typically humans would do, um, that race is on already. And that's actually, as we heard, not happening necessarily in the public space, but that's happening very much in private industry. And so here, just a couple of, of news from the last couple of months. IBM's neurosynaptic chip mimics human brain that is uh, partly financed by the DARPA research, uh, military research funds. Qualcomm has been uh, uh, venturing into putting brain-inspired uh, processors into your mobile phone to have biologically inspired learning um, and that enable devices to see. Uh, Google bought DeepMind, we heard that as well. Um, and essentially IBM uh, forms, it, it rearranges its business to sort of create a, a group uh, to, to valorize uh, what they've done in Watson. So and essentially the race for, for cognitive computing is on, and essentially that clearly is, is sort of a part of um, what we heard in the earlier keynote, which really is happening all around us and where we'll have to find our own answers as to sort of how these this, uh, this, uh, improved abilities of machines, how they will influence our lives. Now, what is important to, to, dis to discriminate here is that if you really want to understand the brain and not just build a machine that does something smart, um, because essentially you want to understand how the brain works and how it produces all its marvels, or especially if you want to understand if what happens if the brain sort of doesn't work so well. You'll have to study the brain. It doesn't help you that you build a jet um, plane to essentially fly, because essentially it's a different system. So essentially here, really, the, 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 the base neuroscience comes into the game. You'll have to essentially wrap your head around all the molecules, all the cells, all the connections, and not just discard that as sort of evolutionary uh, superfluous thing. So it's really like if the brain, the biological brain goes wrong, you'll have to study that brain. Now, and this is really what, what essentially is another moral challenge or ethical challenge, because the burden of brain diseases is dramatic, and there's a burden for the, for the individual, and there's the burden for the uh, economy. And sort of from patient data, so you can go to the hospitals and sort of count how many treatments they do. And they've done that for the European states, and um, deducing from there, you can essentially um, realize that about a third of the European population per year is being traded, treated for brain-related disorders. That cost amounts to about 800 billion euro a year, and that's the cost of the treatment, as well as the cost of the sort of if somebody needs to take care of you and the fact that you can't work. Because don't be mistaken, brain diseases is, for example, if it's something like Alzheimer's, um, they have a very dramatic footprint. They can essentially incapacitate you for many, many years in your life versus uh, more physical diseases like cancer, they actually kill you faster. So um, this is a very pragmatic way of talking about what that means to the individual, but sort of none of us really wants to live for 20 years and have 24-7 care and essentially being like physically alive but sort of not mentally part of your life. What's of course important for our politicians, even in Switzerland the costs are, are dramatic. And essentially these costs are higher than the costs for cancer, diabetes and cardiovascular diseases combined. So also, of course, it doesn't mean that sort of this third of the room sort of has all the brain-related disorders and the other ones are, are okay. Obviously, in the statistics, you're, you include things like headaches, sleep disorders, anxiety, um, uh, for example, addiction, um, to the more extreme diseases like uh, schizophrenia or Alzheimer's or, or brain tumors or trauma. So essentially the statistics of course has all of those. So essentially it doesn't really mean that like every third person is crazy. It just means that sort of the brain as the more central and complex organ um, sort of is, is of course vital for a lot of our, our, our health and, and conditions. Now that statement sort of essentially that would lead you to the facts of, well, I mean, we have to do something about it because actually if you, if you look at the uh, World Health Organization's um, predictions, we're going to live even longer than we live today. 
which is due to a lot of factors, but mainly also because of hygienic improvements. So essentially, we're going to grow older as, an, as a society, and with age, actually, some of the brain diseases that sort of uh, you don't have at young age actually will, 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 will hit us even more. So essentially, it, the, the, the problem is presumably even even increasing, and sort of with an aging population which is living older and sort of less young people, we really have an economic problem at hand, plus of course the, the devastating effects all these diseases might have on your family or yourself. Now, so that would all lead you to the fact that sort of presumably scientists all around the world would jump on that and sort of say, well, well that's a problem, let's, let's solve that, right? That's sort of what we're in for in the game. And indeed, so here I'm showing you the number of peer-reviewed scientific um, articles that mention the word brain in it. And sort of over the last uh, 20 years or so, you essentially see that we've hit um, the number, which is 100,000 scientific, uh, scientific publications per year. The somewhat disturbing factor about that is that sort of how many of those can I read? So I can read a paper a day, maybe, maybe two. I don't, but essentially, so that gives you that the scientists might read, I don't know, a couple of hundred of those, and essentially you do not know what's in the other uh, 99,900. So as a matter of fact, sort of, even though this problem attracts so much attention, we do not really know what our colleagues know. And that sort of is in a field where, where we do not have a theory about the brain. In physics, it's slightly different. We have a good theory, so if somebody comes up with an experiment, we have exactly a category where we can put that experiment. In neuroscience, we really do not know how all these things fit together. And of course, that, that in a way um, can be seen by other parts. If I overlay essentially another metric, which is the number of newly released central nervous system drugs, so FDA approved drugs that sort of come new to the market, essentially you see that the number dropped to five. So in 2012, five new drugs were approved by the FDA. Um, it costs about a billion dollar to develop a drug. And the fact that sort of so few, I mean, and sort of out of these drugs that get approved, um, some of them even get retracted. So out of these five, I think already at least one has been taken off the market due to side effects. Um, the fact that sort of it costs so much money to develop drugs and that it is essentially um, not very successful, we, we, you need blockbusters to, to, to recuperate the investments. Uh, the result is that pharma withdraws. Pharma says, this is, we're not in this game to lose money, we're in this game to make money. So as a matter of fact, uh, the last couple of years saw dramatic uh, changes in the research agendas of, of all of the major players in neuroscience, from GlaxoSmithKline, Pfizer, Merck, Sanofi, actually close to us, Merck, Serono, closed their neuroscientific research part in, in Geneva. Some of them have restarted smaller efforts, but really it is showing that sort of even though we know more and more about the brain, essentially somehow it doesn't come to the benefit of, of, of all of us by sort of coming back in, in better drugs. And that's of course because the brain is so complex. I mean, if you look at the brain and sort of you have your genes, you have then essentially how it unfolds in proteins and to cells and their organizational structures all across. But if you go to your doctor and sort of say, you know what, actually I feel dizzy, you, you're expressing in words something which sort of you, you sense, but essentially somewhere on this level, something might go wrong. And your system might have compensated for it for a long time, and then comes the point where essentially it cannot compensate anymore. And then the, then the doctor gives you a drug, and the drug hits a molecule down here, a receptor, and somehow you hope that this sort of magically unfolds over these nine orders of magnitude of space into something that does good for, for the brain. The brain is tremendously complicated. There's 100 billion neurons in a human brain. Every cell might have in the order of one to 10 billion proteins in, inside. Um, and that's essentially, it, it's, it's, a, it, it's, a pro, it's such a multi-scale problem across spatial and time scales that sort of we, we do not have a causal understanding of what, what does it mean if a drug hits a receptor down here? How does it unfold? So essentially our, our knowledge is of course that we understand portions of, of, these, of the, this biophysics and we have an idea that, ah, okay, we found that essentially in this genetic mutation, if you have that gene, then sort of you don't have that protein and it helps you or it, 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 it's bad for you. So we have, we have correlations, we have some functional knowledge, but we do not have a holistic view. Essentially, as a matter of fact, we don't understand a single drug today of how it actually unfolds in that system. And so that, that led us to, to a position statement saying, 
okay, well, if we, if we put this on the table, what, what is it we're really faced with? And so on the one hand, thanks to computing, thanks to microfluidics, thanks to genome sequencing and all of that, we really have an exponential increase in data. Um, but sort of, as I explained to you with the, with the publications, it is more and more fragmented. So as a matter of fact, sort of even this more data gets more fragmented. And sort of, if you look at least in, in, in terms of patents or, or drugs released to the market, um, the benefits for society seem to be decreasing. Um, while the economic burden is increasing. So that's, that's quite a dramatic statement if you sort of um, uh, make the summary. And in addition, of course, this is because of these multiple scales and that we do not have a good integration plan of how we're actually bridging these scales, how we can decide whether one data is good and another data is not good. How do we actually compare the two? It's really difficult and I'll come back to that question. Um, to, to the point that sort of a lot of the drugs, of course, we, we develop drugs in animal models. That was me. Um, and these animal models, essentially, the, the, a lot of the drugs actually fail when you go from the animal to the human. So essentially, there's something different, um, even though sort of these animal models are, are sort of, you have the same gene mutation, you even sort of try to implant some, some uh, human cells into animals, which, which is nowadays possible. Um, but sort of still it fails in this, in this last stage. And sort of the, the point there is, is, a, is a profoundly ethical one because essentially we cannot and must not test drugs on humans. And so that's why we're testing it in proxy systems. Um, and yet sort of that's one of the big challenges that the proxy system is something else than the real system. So really the question is what can we bring to this table to make this problem better? And so be very careful. We're not saying that we should stop anything of the stuff we're doing. We're just saying we're, we're starving for ideas as to how to make this problem um, easier to tackle. So, and that's exactly where essentially the story of, of our projects and the Blue Brain Project and the Human Brain Project starts. And so I want to share with you this, this idea of, of sort of what we're trying to bring to the table. So I'm, I'm, I'm taking here a somewhat naive view of sort of how scientists sort of go about experimentation and modeling their data. So you have some sort of experiment, you have a microscope, you can count cells or whatever. And then typically what we do when we model it, when we want to understand that experiment, we, we come up with a hypothesis. We say, okay, well, okay, we can, this is a phenomenon which essentially we can explain by this and this. And so we, we, we take some model assumptions, we actually parameterize that model. So essentially say, okay, we take the number of cells and sort of the cells have these interactions, sort of we can essentially predict how this model would behave. And sort of this is really like we do um, a model of uh, like, I don't know, if you want to understand where your car is going to stop. So you model the, the car and how heavy it is, how fast it drives and sort of how, how quickly it can decelerate and all of that. And then you can make a prediction as to where your car is going to stop. That's exactly the same type of, of modeling we're, we're talking about. And of course, the reality is that uh, then you would, you would validate this, this model against reality, so say well, it's a good model, and the reality is sort of if you'll realize your first model sucks and sort of you'll have to inspect and adapt, and sort of, of course, we scratch all these bad ideas and we come up with better ideas. So essentially their science is, is working in principle very, very effectively. So effectively that we actually have created tons of models and hypothesis of how the brain might work. As a matter of fact, we have so many that we actually don't even know how many we have, and they're all unrelated. And that's really one of the challenges that sort of, there's very little insight in these models because they were created to explain one phenomenon, but sort of, if you then sort of say, uh, you know what, can your model also um, explain if that person goes to sleep, that something changes? And I say, ah, you know what, that wasn't in my model assumption. So as a matter of fact, these models have been very tailored, so it have been following this KISS simple, KISS principle, keep it simple, stupid. And sort of that, that led us so far, essentially it created a, a plethora of models which essentially don't really fit together. And again, I, I want to point out that sort of physics somehow has managed, has been following a similar approach and sort of also reduced uh, the, the physics into different example systems and sort of built models. And um, there, for the most part, it actually worked to bring these models together in one theory. And so sort of in physics, we have a fairly um, very consistent um, model of, of the physics, but again, in, in biology, it just hasn't. So as a matter of fact, even physicists, and I can say that because I am a physicist by training, sort of a lot of physicists went into biology in the, in the 80s and so sort of said, you know what, it worked so well in physics, let's apply it to neuroscience, it's going to work well. 
And the same method that worked in physics just didn't work out in biology. And presumably at the basis that we're, we're looking at a much more complex system, and we had sort of another keynote about that. So essentially, um, the, this, this simplification approach hasn't yet led to, to the successes um, we need. And so what we're proposing to, to do differently is something which has been also applied to other complex systems. That's sort of the, the type of an up initio model. So instead of starting with a hypothesis as to what is it you're going to explain in terms of function, you actually put in the, the base ingredients of, of, the, of what you see and then sort of see which emergent phenomena do come out of that. When I say up initio model in physics that has a very particular meaning, it means that sort of you're, you're really starting from the base set of, of your theory and very little um, additional assumptions. And sort of in biology, it's very difficult to start all the way down at the quantum mechanics. So essentially, uh, I'll, I'll allude to a little bit how, how that is, is, is done then in our context. Now, the, the alternative I'm proposing is these up initio type models is to essentially, instead of building one model per experiment, you actually invest into a machinery that consistently updates a single model. So essentially, instead of creating thousands of models, you're creating one model. And the way you do that, of course, so that means your model is going to become more and more complex. And as a matter of fact, in, in the absolute needs way, you actually model everything you find. And sort of in order to make that manageable, you have to make sure that this model can be improved, updated, validated, and so on. So it becomes a very procedural process that you essentially, you really account for all the different pieces, all the ion channels, all the cells. Uh, you create algorithms that can extract parameters out of this data, build computer models, you simulate them, you analyze them, and you, you sort of even say, okay, this, this was not a good iteration, so we'll have to sort of improve the model. And the idea is to sort of use this model as an as a framework, as a, as a scaffolding, where you can put all this data, all this knowledge we find in biology in one place, as opposed to sort of it being scattered all across in different publications. Another way to look at it is sort of maybe the more accountant way. So essentially, you, you say what you really are doing is, on the one hand, you have, you have experimental data. You put it into databases, and so if you, you, you file it away. And then what you really have is an Excel sheet where sort of each row is, is, a, is something you can measure, the number of cells, the densities of these cells, uh, what types of cells, how they connect. Um, and sort of you become very, very accountant, and essentially you really extract, okay, look, out of this experiment, I can extract these values. And in a way, you could say you would do that so carefully that sort of one of these Excel sheets is for a mouse, another one is for a rat, another one is for a primate, another one is for a human. Obviously, they're all different, right? So you can't really uh, exchange that. And sort of they're presumably different per developmental stage. I mean, if you're an, an adolescent or a, a young animal, essentially, then sort of your brain might be different than from an adult. So you have to become very, very, very um, precise about what you're doing. And then what you do is you apply computing technology, software. You, you try to sort of, with, it, with the things you could measure, you say, say, that's interesting. If I know the volume of the brain and I know how many cells, I can actually infer what is the cell density. I could infer what's the density of, of the fabric you're coming out. So you actually realize that sort of these values are not independent, but you can use these, this data to extract principles and essentially make predictions as to other things which you weren't able to measure directly how they could like, because essentially these, these, this data is interrelated. And that, that's the key. As a matter of fact, we realize we very likely will never be able to measure everything about the brain. And that has been a big criticism about what, what we're doing in neuroscience. Is you, they say, you know what, how can you start modeling? That we don't know enough. I mean, we'll have to wait until we know the connectome. We have to understand, wait before we have uh, um, other data sets about activity. But the point is, some of these data sets are so laborious to get and the incentive is really, I mean, they're, they're, these data sets are uh, gathered by scientists, and scientists want to sort of get promoted. They want to do their PhD thesis, they want to be promoted as, into real scientists. And so if you really get your promotion once you actually do sexy science, stuff that's new, if you're doing the same stuff somebody else has done before, eh, that sort of might get you a master's degree. But PhD, it's already 
problematic because essentially if it's not novel, you won't be able to publish it. So essentially science, by the way its incentive system works, is some of these, these fields might never be measured. So essentially it becomes very relevant, the questions of how are we going to, to, to understand the brain if some of these things won't get measured. And so one of the ideas we have, of course, is well, if you build a model and you can essentially use those data you have to actually predict what's in the gaps, that might be a first test, the first prediction of what's in these things, uh, which essentially is exactly what these are. And then you can sort of say, if you realize that in your model this is a crucial parameter, you actually can go out and say, now it's worthwhile to do that experiment and measure it. And of course, this will also become very interesting because essentially you will fill this, these tables for certain species which are accessible, where essentially you can use invasive uh, experimentation, and sort of then you'll have to learn how to essentially make the correlation between other species. And there's, of course, the single cell transcriptome is, a, is an important aspect in there, but I will not go into the details. Now, that's exactly what we did. So in, in the Blue Brain project uh, over the last eight and a half years, we essentially, so here you see a, see a space scale from, from nanometers, so where you're, you have your DNA to, to the human brain, or, and sort of we, we attacked a certain part of that. So essentially we tried to put this Apinizio type model uh, to the test with data that essentially was readily available in the, in the laboratory of, of Henry Markram, who's the origin, the director and founder of the Blue Brain Project. And so this is really electrophysiology, so the, from the level of ion channels to, to uh, networks, thousands of cells. So it doesn't go all the way to the chemistry, it doesn't go all the way to the, to the whole brain. So essentially it was a proof of concept. And so to give you an idea what this means, so we, th this data set in particular we start out with comes from rodents, from rats. We essentially um, work on brain slices, so we indeed take out the brain and sort of slice it, and we can then apply certain types of stainings. And that's, by the way, what, an, what a biologist calls six layers of structure. When you are an engineer or uh, a computer scientist, a physicist, you ask yourself a question, where are the layer boundaries? So there, it starts to, so you, you understand that there are some different, different problems at hand. But so if you, we can throw a lot of technology at that level, and sort of there, is, there has been Nobel Prizes awarded as to technologies that allow you to really, so every dot, by the way, is a cell. Um, and so this is the neocortex, which essentially covers uh, in the human 80% of the brain is where we think is the, the base of our cognitive capabilities. So the rats have a similar structure. And sort of uh, in a laboratory, we really can, can target any single one of these cells and, and record, stain that cell, even can extract cytoplasm out of it and so to understand which genes are expressed. So essentially, th this, is, this is a dream because essentially we really can, can go in and do all this accounting work as to sort of what is it we find in that piece of brain tissue. And that's exactly what we did. And sort of, I, I'm not expected that sort of we, we, we sort of have an intimate chat about the biology here, but so if I just show you that sort of for all these, these layers, we really did this job of sort of measuring all the things that are there. And again, be reminded, so this is in this Apinizio type model, you simply, you don't make a qualification of why is it that sort of, why should we have uh, this potassium channel or this sodium channel? Why should we have a certain type of morphology? So as a matter of fact, we found 55 different types of cells. So as a matter, nobody can answer to you, <laughs> what does that cell type do? And is it really important? And so this is where a lot of the previous models came up with a hypothesis and you say, you know what, this cell is so rare, why would you include that into your model? And that's exactly where this, this type of modeling changes. You sort of say, the reason that you found it there you simply put it into your model, and then you can sort of later on decide uh, or examine what is the role of that, that um, player. And sort of it goes on, so essentially cells have a certain shape, they, they speak a language, some of them are very regular, like a Swiss clock, others are more chaotic, and sort of speak others. And so if you, you model all of this behavior um, uh, in, in, in your computer model, you essentially uh, get organizational principles. Where do you find which type of cell? So we did over, more than over 20,000 uh, experiments that essentially tell us frequencies as to where did we find which type of cells and so on. And in addition, we have ideas of how they connect. What does it happen if cells essentially talk to each other? And so this is really, it's, it's a lot of information that comes together, and sort of this is this is tens, if not hundreds, of of, of papers and sort of, of data sets that that go into this. But what the result is that sort of we reconstructed in the computer that sort of has about the size of a, of a, of a, a tip of a um, pin, or a, um, 
Uh, like it's about a cubic millimeter in size, a pinhead, exactly. And so this has 31,000 cells. And sort of with this computer model, you actually can do an amazing number of things because you build it without any particular hypothesis. You can then ask the question, oh, that's interesting. Now that you can pick any cell out of that and sort of who is connecting to that cell. Um, so you can make predictions about the pathways. You can predictions as to sort of what are the strengths of these pathways. You can even predict sort of how this, this tissue would behave if you change the, the calcium concentration or something. So you, what you created is, is a virtual specimen, which you can then, in a laboratory, in the computer, essentially uh, do experiments with. So this is not the answer to sort of how the brain works. What it is, it's, it's a virtual specimen and sort of in, in, if, if, we were, if you were from car manufacturing, you would be saying, oh, that, that's what we've done since, since 30 years. So essentially, there you've built your computer, in, in your car models in the computer, and you run this virtual car model into a wall, into a virtual wall, before you actually build the real prototype, and then crash the real prototype in a wall. And essentially, you do that only to validate whether your, your predictions have been, have been correct or wrong, and then you would essentially improve your model. And that's exactly what we managed to sort of now have for biology. So we have a virtual model of a, of, of a brain tissue, and now we can start to really ask very interesting questions. We can ask the question, what happens if I knock out this cell? What happens if I change the calcium concentration down here? It's, it's a novel tool. And so we've, we succeeded in, in, in building that, and sort of I'll tell you a little bit what it takes to do that. But what is very interesting and sort of... That wasn't meant to be there. Um, what you now can do is you can actually, because essentially I, 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 told into my, I told you about this position statement that how is it that you can actually bridge these scales. In a model, you can actually do it. What you see here in, in false colors is actually the local field potential that is caused by all the currents that, so again, this, these are cell bodies, and sort of you see they look like trees, and sort of there are ion channels all across these branches, and sort of thanks to the neural activity, sort of currents flow, and they create an electrical field, and then they all sum up. And essentially, you see here how, due to a certain activity stimulation, local fields are created. Now, why would we care for local fields? Local fields are actually the base for EEG. So if you go to your doctor and they, they put you these electrodes on your head, they measure an EEG, and to date, your doctor says, oh, oh, there's a kink in your EEG, that doesn't look good. We, we know that by correlation this is related to some problem. But we didn't understand where this kink was coming from. A model now allows you to sort of say, that's very interesting. A kink in the EEG is actually created by a activity of a certain type of cell which sort of suddenly uh, 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 goes into high frequency oscillations or something like that, that I, I just made up. And so the point really is that simulation and a model has this capability, capability to make this causal link, make a forward prediction as to sort of how a component of the model actually might affect a higher order emergent phenomenon. And sort of this is really what this fourth paradigm of science, essentially what we heard about with big data, and sort of where you do correlation, it's very difficult. You, you essentially hardly can extract any causal link. So it's really the modeling that sort of allows you to sort of complement uh, experiment and, and, and uh, theory to a way that you really bridge these scales. So we've managed to, to do that, and essentially that really served as a proof of concept. So that's what we've been working on in the last couple of years, and sort of at the base, at the heart of that, is an ICT problem. So essentially, we created a huge set of workflows, which so starts from the experiment to essentially extracting parameters to then running simulations and actually bringing the scientists back into the loop. Because it's not a computer scientist that will eventually tell you whether this, this experiment, uh, this in silico experiment, is going well. You want to have a neuroscientist doing an experiment on your computer. So essentially, there are more than 35 software programs involved, uh, which mostly were built by our team uh, over the last couple of years. And you see a little bit here sort of what does it mean in terms of computation. This is possible, and it has become possible um, thanks to the development of, of computing power. So 10 years ago or 20 years ago, computers were not powerful enough to run these type of simulations. So we are, we, we, a single neuron today, we are, we are modeling with about 20,000 differential equations. You need a lot of computing power to solve these differential equations. And so here's an example of a computer we, we um, bought last year, 
which is uh, actually at the last November was the 47th fastest computer in the world dedicated to this Blue Rain project. And sort of it, what's uh, spectacular about these things sort of is it has a lot, lot of processors, but they're tightly interconnected. So you can run software that runs on all these processors at the same time and allows you to communicate it. So this way we can actually solve these differential equations of, of many, many neurons, um, not in real time, but sort of in, in turnaround time that really makes that possible. And so what is so critical about it is sort of here I have, I'm taking the, compute, the co computing requirements of what it takes to actually model a, a brain or a piece of a brain in that level of detail. And sort of this is a log, double logarithmic plot. So every tick is a factor of 10. The problem is on, on these types of plots, any big advancement sort of looks like a tiny little thing. So as a matter of fact, when we started in 2005, we had a supercomputer, and then sort of four years later, we had a supercomputer that brought us exactly this few millimeters on this graph forward, and today's supercomputer brought us here. So essentially, we, we were able to really, thanks to technology, uh, we were able to simulate a substantial piece of brain tissue, essentially the size of a pinhead, uh, on this first supercomputer, and nowadays we're coming to the realm that we can use the same type of fidelity of a model for an entire rodent, brain, mouse, or rat uh, at the same level of detail. But don't be mistaken, sort of, um, if you actually want to go here, so that means you want to run a, simu a cellular simulation of a human brain, you will have to make a factor of 1,000 improvement on these axes. And a factor of 1,000 is a lot. Think of just your car would sort of become a factor of 1,000 times faster. That would mean instead of driving 100 kilometers an hour, 100,000 kilometers an hour, that will not happen. But interestingly enough, computing, is making this type of progress in essentially 10 to 12 years. So supercomputers over the last um, uh, 30 years have been making, in fact, a thousand leap forward every 10 to 12 years. Now, that's driven by, by national security or by essentially uh, uh, the nuclear stockpile stewardship because essentially the, the big countries only agreed to not do, do testing of the nuclear weapons um, in the real world because they can do simulations that assures them that their, simulation, that their weapons still work. So that's really what's driving these, these big supercomputers and so sort of we thought it's a much better idea to put them to use for neuroscience. So we find it very exciting that they're actually now as we speak have become powerful enough to really start addressing the, the brain simulations. But we mustn't fool ourselves. So essentially, if we really include more chemistry, more subcellular detail, and sort of ask other questions, we will need even more computing power. So essentially, if that brings us back to the, to the earlier keynote we had, sort of there, there is still a lot of compute innovation that has to go on before we actually sort of really can run brain simulations at a, at a high fidelity. But so sort of it's still interesting. And I think we shouldn't miss that train. And we really should put this technology to the use of, of, of neuroscience. Now, and it's really this convergence which, which is at the base of what then brings us to the Human Brain Project. It's the convergence that really in neuroscience, medicine, and computing, these last 30 years, I don't expect you to read it so I can tell you whatever I want, but sort of really, I mean, from the in, introduction of the personal computer to supercomputers that really are, are so immensely powerful to the fact that we have sequenced the genome, that we can do that now as a commodity, we can sequence any genome we want, um, we can create um, uh, optogenetics, we can essentially create animals where we can sort of use light to stimulate the individual targeted cells. Um, the, uh, Paul Allen, one of the co-founders of Microsoft, has essentially launched a big neuroscience initiative in Seattle, the Allen Brain Institute. And sort of there, there has been an amount of, of activity in all these fields that really you can say, wait a second, there's a lot going on, but sort of what is the possibility to actually bring this all together? That's what's, what's missing. So essentially we, we can see that really every day you can read the news and so there's a new uh, new invention, new publication, new initiative going off. But sort of what is it that sort of allows us to bring this all together? And so the goal of the Human Brain Project really is to use information and communication technology as a catalyst for global collaborative effort um, to understand the human brain, its diseases, and of course, we shouldn't forget, the brain is a, uh, is a information processing device. So I mean, if we understand the brain, yes, that ought to help us to build systems that sort of can compute the way the brain might compute. And really, these are the three goals of the project. Now, um, the, the pre-work of what we did in Switzerland, as well as other partners in Europe, really uh, convinced Europe that sort of we, it's time for us to put such a project together. 
And they decided to put out something very new, a funding instrument that would allow to fund research for a time frame of 10 years, and that's unheard of. I mean, normally research funding is a lot shorter. And 10 years is a long time. It's very hard to predict what happens in, in 10 years, especially with all this exponentially increasing um, technologies. But, but yet, so the idea was to actually have a moon landing vision, have a long-term vision that would, would bind and federate people together. And that's exactly what we, what we applied for. We essentially made uh, several proposals. I spare you the details of how much bureaucracy that is in, in Europe. Um, but so we succeeded. And the idea is that the promise is that there is up to 100 million euro of funding uh, for 10 years. Now, of course, um, you divide that by the number of partners. So essentially, in the first phase, actually, we, we got a lot less money. But sort of, it's 112 um, partner institutions, 112 universities, mostly in Europe, some in the United States and in other, other countries. So per partner per year, it's, it's a reasonable amount. But what's new is it's really that there's a, it's a unifying vision for 10 years to come. And, um, Sort of what I explained to you, this unifying model is really at the base of what this, this human brain project is about. So essentially, we will build unifying models for the mouse and the human. And the reason why we do that is really the mouse is the one species which is sort of most, we understand the best in terms of genetics. And so it's really the one where we can do uh, invasive experimentation. And so we have a lot of data. So essentially, we will apply this methodology, which I showed you, to the entire, all the regions of, of a mouse brain. And then essentially, we, we do, I mean, the goal is the human brain. Right? We want to understand how it works and how it doesn't work. And the problem, on the other hand, is that there's a lot less data. It's anecdotal data. I mean, you will presumably not sign up and so say, will you donate your brain for invasive brain research? And you shouldn't, right? So the point is, so there is certain data we will never get, and we have to face that. So we can do non-invasive measurements, and fMRI, they get stronger, stronger magnets, so have better resolution. But it's, it's no match to sort of the, the detailed access we have in, 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 uh, in rodents. And so the real thing is that essentially we'll have to learn how to sort of go from what we learned in the mouse to the human, and that's predictions. And sort of, as I told you, the single cell transcriptome will be a big factor in that, so that we actually learn which genes are switched on, and then can make an educated prediction as to sort of how that, that change unfolds in between species. Um, obviously, brains do not live in isolation. So essentially, brains have sensors, have sensory stimulation, um, and they are actions. And sort of, in the end, if you, if you go down that road and you want to sort of model an entire brain, you will want to include closed loop behavior. And sort of, if you do a brain in simulation, you presumably want to do this closed loop behavior in simulation simply because uh, you can't promise that you can solve all these equations in real time. So you might as well sort of delay the environment around and sort of simulate it as well. Now, at the same time, I told you the brain is an information processing device. And sort of the idea would be is that while you're actually learning to piece the brain together, you can sort of say, ah, oh, that's interesting. That's how the visual system works. So maybe I can use that to sort of inspire computing technology, which we call, well, novel computing or neuromorphic computing. So you're using the information processing architecture of the brain to solve brain-like computing problems. But there, again, I don't think that brain-inspired computing will replace our digital computing. Because, I mean, we, digital computers are very good at solving differential equations or calculate the billions after comma digit of pi. If you give that to a human, the human will say, uh-oh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll stop after the first after comma digit, right? And on the other hand, sort of, we are very good in, in, in recognizing appro uh, approximate solutions and scenes and so on where computers suck. So in that sense, very, we, we really think there is a potential to sort of uh, have a new type of information processing systems. In the end, of course, it is not just about the healthy brain. You will have to get medical data. And sort of this is, this is a very interesting field, because essentially, uh, for, for the longest time, we've been giving diseases labels by symptoms. And sort of what really this is about is we want to actually get the signatures of diseases. We want to understand in which parameters does this disease is based on maybe on, on the fact that there are more cells that are connected slightly differently and that receptor is not present or it's overexpressed and so on. We want to get to this, to this biological signature so that we eventually can sort of instruct these models and actually try to model this disease and how essentially a, a, a drug might unfold in the context of a certain disease variation. Um, 
And so this is exactly, so again, the, at the heart of the Human Brain Project is information and, and uh, uh, communication technology. So we call this platform. So we will build web accessible platforms where actually all the partners of these 112 institutions around the world will be able to actually do this type of research collaboratively on one model. And that's really, that, that's, that's the difference. I mean, in the, in the past, it was too easy for these groups to sort of just work on their little issue, their little issue published and then sort of not work together. So what we really want, we want to tap into, into this intelligence of all these people working together. And in that sense, sort of, um, we, we have similarities to the virtual choir, we have similarities to other network phenomena. It is really something which we want to bring into science to, to make that work. And so now it comes, uh, comes a very interesting point. And I told you that in the beginning, so that science, it's very difficult to sort of talk about science if it sort of hasn't yet delivered what it is. So what we can talk about is, on the one hand, these platforms, th this is almost an engineering challenge. I mean, it's, it's, it's tough engineering because we are also uh, assuming that sort of computing will grow by a factor of thousand. That means your number of threats goes up by a number of thousands. That's all tough work. We want to build, uh, uh, bring uh, um, search systems into hospitals where essentially we have to worry about anonymity. So, I mean, there's unsolved problems all over, but it still boils down to a set of engineering uh, challenges which essentially, thanks to prior work of the Brubeam project, as well as many other European initiatives, we have a good handle, we have a good head start on how that works. So we, we really think, like, in a, in a product development sense, we can get first releases of these platforms to our own consortium and to researchers outside. And sort of, with the years to come, we will boost the capabilities of these platforms. So essentially, we will grow them by a factor of 1,000, we'll integrate more data, we'll make, uh, 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 integrate more cellular data, more, more molecular data. So essentially, there's an entire roadmap of how we're going to move forward. And then comes, of course, the notion of what can you do with that? And sort of, we have a commitment that sort of on this, on this roadmap, there will be certain drafts of, of integrated brain models for the mouse and for the human. But sort of, I've been choosing very sort of unromantic uh, terms here. So I'm, like, I'm, I'm, I'm showing you that sort of we're de developing a capability. We're, we're developing a microscope which sort of increases in resolution. And sort of, we will make this available to ours and other scientists to sort of do their research with this instrument, allow a farmer to use that to essentially test their drugs, allow a computing company to use that to sort of say, wait a second, can I essentially uh, extract a certain type of computing out of that? Or we will use, uh, allow uh, uh, medical researchers to sort of say, wait a second, how do my patients cluster? So it's, it's very important that sort of we discriminate sort of the, the, the possible outcomes from sort of what we really can commit to. The way we sort of think of it, that these six platforms are really at the heart of, of this project and really will accelerate of how neuroscience, medicine and computing is, is being done. So we are for, in these three research areas, we will provide novel tools to scientists to integrate data and to do in silico experiments for accelerating neuroscience. And really, we want to allow them to sort of all these theories that float around of how the brain might work to sort of link that to a ground truth model and eventually to experiment in data. And sort of we really want them to sort of use this facility to sort of integrate our understanding about the brain. And sort of, yes, that ought to help us answer some questions. Is the human brain unique? Because if you can compare it to the mouse brain, sort of what is it that sort of is so different and what the, the mouse brain doesn't have? I mean, can we actually um, predict uh, certain data sets which are not there. In the medicine, the same thing. We will provide novel tools to scientists to mine clinical data and to accelerate uh, medical and pharmaceutical research. Again, we want to go from symptom-based classification to really disease signatures and sort of say, it doesn't help us if we study Alzheimer's, if essentially Alzheimer's is not one disease. So as a matter of fact, we've done, or colleagues of us have done work where they show Alzheimer's is not one disease. You put sort of uh, objective clustering for these disease cases, and you find out there are at least six subtypes of Alzheimer's. Now, it's not so, no surprise that so if you apply a drug, and it doesn't work properly, because essentially you're actually trying to treat six different diseases. So essentially all of this, this, uh, this ICT capability ought to really help us sort of sift through why is it that certain things weren't successful. So we really expect that so this will immediately have impacts on, on how certain um, 
uh, drugs might be retested or test the drugs that have been taken out of the pipeline and so if you, you, you will reintegrate and so say, ah, that's interesting. And now on this subgroup, it might work. And eventually simulate, make computational models of diseases. And but there sort of, I'm becoming more vague. So I can't promise you that sort of in year seven, I can sort of, I have solved uh, Alzheimer's disease, but I can tell you that sort of our technological platforms will allow you to sort of do these types of studies. And so the same for computing. That sort of we will really make make supercomputers uh, usable as scientific instruments. It's a big debate. Supercomputers are very ugly beasts. They're very difficult to use. And sort of we want to really uh, bring this this uh, technology into everyday use. If you close the loop, I mean, it is about robots. So we're not going to build robots, but essentially we'll be able to sort of test our brain models in virtual environments, which ought to help robotic development to sort of come up with more smart controllers for robots. And ultimately, of course, as I said, the brain is an information processing device. So essentially, if you understand how the brain processes information, if you can take that same principle and build a more efficient system that sort of uses and implements this principle. So we really think that sort of this co concerted effort, this orchestrated effort of really integrating what we know about brain data will, will really change how over the next 10 years we can, we can integrate this, this knowledge for for the um, biological understanding, for the disease understanding, and for computing understanding. And especially in the light of the other keynote we heard, at the heart of the Human Brain Project, it's publicly funded. It's funded by the European Commission and the European Member States. There is no military funding inside, which is very important. There is no private company funding inside. And sort of with that, we actually have a commitment for res to responsible innovation. So really want that the conceptual and technological outcomes of the HPP should be for the benefit of all and meet the requirements of responsible innovation. We're very happy we have Jean-Pierre Changeux in Institut Pasteur, who is actually leading an entire sub-project of, uh, of the Human Brain Project. And we have, as a fabric, embedded foresight methodology, which essentially allows us to sort of make prediction scenarios. We'll have um, a public dialogue. We'll engage with the public. We'll have an internal dialogue. We'll make researchers' awareness. We'll set standards. I mean, in this context, we are well aware that sort of we're Everything is fine as long as you sort of say, you know what, these guys are, anyways, they will not succeed. And the moment we actually will succeed, these questions are absolutely relevant. Essentially, we all want to live in a future that actually makes this for the benefit of us and not sort of something that, that replaces us. So really, for us, this has been an extremely important aspect. It's sort of, uh, we, we uh, dedicate 3% of our budget to these questions. I want to close on one slide, which I think in this context is really something which also might have um, future uh, contact points. We're faced with a unique multidisciplinary challenge. We have 112 partners, that is 130 scientists. They come from very diverse backgrounds, from philosophy to, to uh, experimental cellular biology to theoreticians to computer scientists. They have all learned different methods. They speak different languages, literally. So they speak different European languages. They speak different scientific languages. Um, and essentially, what, what binds them together? As scientists, we are trained to disagree. It's an amazing feature. That makes it so, so powerful, essentially. You say something, and it will be my pleasure to try to find the argument of why what you say is not right. Now, imagine that in a consortium with, with 130 professors, 500 scientists, they're all sort of trying to prove each other wrong. Now, that's, that's sort of a big challenge. Plus, of course, we don't have a single authority. We have no single organization. They all adhere to different countries, different organizations. Plus, they want to sort of make their own careers. I mean, scientists are being rewarded by publications they publish with first authors. Something, this collaborative brain science will essentially yield papers which has 500 authors. If you're a number, author number 237, what does that mean? Does it, anybody will recognize you for the fact, oh, that's a great guy because you're in this position? No, right? So essentially, they're, they're real challenges. And I, I would say the biggest challenge for the success of such a project really is whether we will actually overcome um, and sort of put uh, uh, the multidisciplinary issue and sort of make these people work together. And I think there's hope. CERN has managed to do that. I mean, that CERN has shown that sort of uh, thousands of people can come together and build the most complex systems in the world. Um, Essentially, we've seen that other large-scale science projects are popping up around the world, like the Brain Initiative of the US, Allen Brain Institute, and essentially they all have seen that sort of a single scientist approach doesn't yield the sort of integrative uh, knowledge we need. 
Um, and sort of even funding agencies realize that sort of counting publications is not the only metric, and sort of maybe we should uh, should reward people for the amount of open source project they've been doing. And then ultimately, sort of in the in the Bluebrain project in Switzerland, we are a team now of 90 people, and so we're really trying to do science software co-development, and we actually listen and carry very carefully to a lot of agile ideas, and sort of really scratching in our heads and hitting them against the wall of like how can we actually make something like uh, agile work in the scientific uh, context where essentially we need to know what's behind the interface, what's in the black box, where essentially we really need to question all these details and, and yet sort of make it uh, a plannable and, and, uh, and a modern uh, process where we can tap into the brains of, of everybody. I think that's maybe for the next and another uh, encounter at this conference. And with that, essentially, I really want to thank you and sort of invite you to, to visit our website and follow what we were doing. Thank you very much. <laughs>